Welcome to the Rebecca Panapinto Project. Today, I am very excited to host William Gilchrist, who is the CEO of Consig. Consig is a global sales organization that is bringing 15 plus years of technology sales experience from across North America, Europe, Middle East, and Asia Pacific. William holds a BA in international relations, as well as many certifications in Mandarin from Cornell and Beijing universities. With a diverse career spanning media relations, business administration, business development, and management roles at Google, as well as many Singapore-based startups, Gilchrist now leads Consig, and he is providing an end-to-end -end sales solution for enterprises and SMEs worldwide. He's a seasoned sales professional and the epitome of a successful entrepreneur. Today, William shares a bunch of really interesting and exciting stories with us, all about his journey to building what Consig is known as today. Enjoy the show. William, welcome to the show today. Thanks a lot for having me. It's exciting. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you. You're happy, healthy, back to the real world. So I was hoping one of your first things on your agenda was coming to be a guest on the show. So I'm glad this worked out today. This is definitely my first time upright in a few months, recovering from a herniated disc. But, um, you know, we made it happen. So I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, and kudos to you for pushing through and continuing to run your business at full steam, even with not 100%. That speaks a lot to the type of entrepreneur you are. So excited to talk especially about that today. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, a, it's always a challenge every day. So injured or not, um, the show's got to go on. I love it. So let's start there talking about Consig, your awesome business where you help folks with their sales organizations and their go-to-market internationally. So I'm sure you're on lots of planes, lots of time zones. But tell us a little bit about what you're doing in the industry right now. Yeah, well, I mean, we were founded um, almost seven years ago. And our main focus was to assist companies, whether they be startups or enterprises or even governments, in being better at their sales, better revenue generators. One of the things that got me to start the business was realizing that there were a lot of titles that was, you know, sales, VP of sales, regional sales manager, but really ultimately um, those systems just had issues. So we're kind of there to, on one end, call out those gaps, but on another end, actually help and say, hey, look, you know, here's some better ways in order to um, run your sales more, more efficiently. I love it. And, you know, on my show, we talk a ton about digital transformation and what that exactly means in your business. Typically, it's like a CIO or a CTO I'm talking to, but your perspective is going to be super unique to what I typically run across. So I want to hear from you when you're in this situation, helping these companies say, hey, you can, you know, increase your sales by X percent using digital, using AIML. What does that conversation usually look like and what are some of the solutions that you're able to bring to the table? Well, normally, um, it, it actually started probably, I started seeing more digital transformation titles or director of digital transformation. Uh, sometimes you see it as like director of growth and then slash digital transformation. I started seeing those titles really pop up uh, more in 2015. The 2015 to 2018 range started seeing those titles pop up more, right? Um, and when we started Consig and we started working with those digital transformation people, more often than not, it came down to one word, automation. How to better automate something within the business. Now for sales, it was how better to automate, not sales, but elements of sales, right? So it was bringing in products and bringing in uh, technologies into the business to be able to transform the that which was manual before, right? So in our world, more often than not, digital transformation applies to just automating manual processes one way or the other, right? I think that uh, a new digital transformation is, you know, chat GPT, right? That is, uh, if we're bringing that in and integrating it into our business, well, that is a automation, definitely. Uh, it, it has more output with less manual work, and you've now digitally transformed a manual process in your business, right? So that's how we usually deal with kind of that word more often than not. I like it. Well, and typically for me with tools like ChatGPT you mentioned, it's helping person in like an individual contributor role be more creative, think bigger, like just build upon some foundations that they already have of how they want to message something, how they want to reach out to a customer and thinking at it through a different lens and the kind of like, I use it to bounce ideas off and help me think bigger and approach a problem differently than I would have just kind of stuck in a narrow mindset or maybe like how we used to do things. 
Um, so I love to use it in that context of um, bettering yourself, having it be kind of come part of the sales team to a, a degree saying like, how would you do this? What do you think? And then it can gather that information from areas of different industries and other groups and how they leverage their sales strategy, their go to market and give you ideas that you maybe wouldn't have thought about. And then it's up to you how you use it and incorporate it into what you actually want to accomplish. No, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, you know, I, I was laughing and saying, you know, there's resistance to things like ChatGPT and new technologies in general. Our business is selling new technologies into individuals that probably never heard of these technologies before. And more often than not, we are the people selling the calculators when the calculator was first invented. Oh my God, it's going to destroy math. And oh my God, math is going to be out of the equation. You know, um, we got to go back to the abacus. Like, no, actually the calculator just allows people, math still exists. It just allows people to be able to calculate large quantities faster, complex quantities faster. So we can spend more time doing things that we need to be doing, which is enhancing certain parts of our business, our life, uh, cooking recipe. It's, it's, that's a digital transformation, but that's way back, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Oh, and now, yeah, certain levels of math, you would not even be in the class and successful without a calculator. So William, I want to now get your perspective on something that's super top of mind for me, because like literally this week, I ran across another person who has left their full-time CIO job to be a fractional consulting IT leader. And I'm sure this is happening constantly in your space, and you're even offering that service to your customers. So I want your perspective on why this is happening and how we pivot to be successful as we see more and more fractional roles taking over important jobs within the company, like the IT strategy, like the sales strategy. Well, I think we are, I, I have a very odd perspective on all this. You know, um, the whole concept of decentralization is where we actually originally came from. If you think about it, you know, when you're looking at, um, Herod's or Selfridge's store, or even go further back, um, companies weren't structured the way we are accustomed to them back then, right? There were a lot of decentralized roles. There was the person who worked in this particular, uh, for this particular group in this, this company between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. And then there was another group that were, and then he, they, they moved over to this company later, right? You go to the blacksmith to fix one particular thing, and then you go over to this individual to do those things. So when you're looking at how business was done before, I think considering um, we had a big shock with COVID, and effectively COVID challenged a lot of things. It put a lot of people that might not necessarily be best suited for the office back to work in really executive roles. We can communicate more digitally, even though we always could, there was a cultural kind of break that needed to happen and COVID did that where it forced us to do business decentralized. So I think a lot of organizations realize maybe you don't quite need one CTO that's sitting in the office all day, every day, being the CTO in a glass you know, office, you know, with a big, you know, degree on the, on their wall. Maybe that individual could be in Bali for a while. Maybe that person could be traveling around to Singapore and still be an effective CTO. Now, Consig has existed in this manner long before COVID hit the ground. So with us, we were always decentralized. We have offices around the world, but we were always decentralized in terms of how we worked as a sales organization for our clients. And we've really put to challenge the concept of why do you have a vice president of sales? For what? You're paying this person a very large salary. Then on top of their salary, they have to hire a team, which is more salaries that you're paying. And then effectively, if that team does not perform, all the VP of sales needs to do is say, well, they didn't do well, let's replace them. And then, you know, they just have to wait it out for about nine months, it takes about three months to fire them. Then they got a year on their LinkedIn and I moved on. I, I, I graduated, I moved on to the next opportunity. And that's been happening for years. And I think companies just accepted that as the norm. And effectively this new concept or not even new, this return to kind of the original way business was done, which is leveraging people's talents within a realistic and a practical time frame, 
it, it has not slowed down productivity. It's not slowed down the effectiveness. So I think it's great that there's more decentralization, that there are people that are CTOs across multiple companies or CIOs across multiple companies, or there's a consig out there to be able to say, hey, look, we can sell your, your tech, your products anywhere. And, you know, there's plenty of other organizations as well that, that, that do that service. But I think it, it speaks to our evolution professionally and socially as well. Like things are just, we're, we're changing for the better, but we're changing to kind of leverage the strengths, I think, of where we came from long before these stone jungles of corporations kind of entered the, the world, you know. Within all this, your sales philosophy and how it's evolved and changed, because I know you have a foundation of the Sandler system talking to you for five minutes. I think a lot of that has just been foundation. There's a lot of William special sauce all over where you came from as it relates to your sales philosophy. So where do you stand on that? And as you're engaging with the company, what is that philosophy you're bringing to them of how they're going to go to market and how they're going to be successful with their sales engine? Well, the first thing that I tend to, I mean, from a, from a uh, trained perspective, uh, I was trained in, yes, the Sandler kind of sales methodology um, uh, under uh, Raymond McConnell, Kyle Hegarty, these are individuals that put me in the Sandler program and they really said, okay, you have some natural skill sets. Uh, it would be great to put you in our program to really take those skill sets and make it stronger. But what I learned through going through such extensive training with Sandler, I learned that what the most important lesson is to internalize and make it your own. And once you've made a methodology or a system or a sales philosophy your own, it's much easier for you to naturally be able to put it out there. And that learning is the principle that I give to my clients, right? Our clients sometimes will listen to podcasts, will read a bunch of sales books, will look at a blog and say, your business should be here at this particular time within this particular week, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that is great for that company or all of that is great for this company or these particular colors for your logo are the best way to get attention. That's very toxic material because it removes the personalization. What works for you? What is the natural realities of your business? Just because you're similar to this company or let's say you're totally unique from this company, how your business and how your sales like prowess is going to go out there is actually going to be completely unique to not only your company, but the situations that you're in and to you and the individuals in your organization as well. So that's kind of how I would say my sales background has kind of bled into um, being a sales consultant, outsourced sales mercenary, right? More often than not, I'm always saying, hey, you know, we have to identify how this particular product sells in this particular market at this particular time in this particular era with these particular circumstances. There's no blog or podcast that will ever be able to tell you that answer. And no forecast can magically give you the number either. So when it comes to sales skills or even entrepreneurial tendencies, do you think a lot of it can be learned or is more of it an inherent thing that's either in you? or not? Wow. Very interesting question. Um, I would argue that uh, it's something that has to be, uh, I'll talk about the entrepreneurial part first. Is that fair? Uh, and then I'll go into the sales piece because there's a little bit more technicalities there. Um, I think from an entrepreneurial space, uh, space I think it is emotional, uh, but there's two different types of entrepreneurs. There's the funded entrepreneur. There's the person who's just going out there trying to get funding, right? They don't really, they're looking just to exit, start a business. They don't really care about it. They just found a good thing, trying to get funding, run it for about two years and try to sell it off and exit and in and out, right? That's one type of entrepreneur. I don't know if they have that much of an emotional connection to their project, right? I don't know. It might be sounding more judgy, but I don't know if they have the emotional connection because they're willing to exit. They're not willing to go down with the ship, right? Um, but when it comes down to the individuals who start businesses that are there for the long haul, right? There is no real exit in mind. They're not necessarily seeking investors. They're not uh, looking at the revenue from a 
how do we you know get x number of percentage month on month we just want to do good work we just want to continuously provide good services or good technology for the world and that's our passion that's what we do i think those people what gets them to um, have it has to be an emotional connection that's in you and usually there needs to be a set of circumstances that gets you the oomph or the spark to be able to do it and that's not in everyone uh to be honest uh right in the beginning of Consig, that wasn't in me right i was petrified at the last minute to actually start a business at the last minute and it was a phone call with my dad uh where he kind of um challenged me a bit you know he said i invested in you raised you put you in all these schools and all that stuff and and you're scared you're scared to start a business you know and it really kind of challenged me quite a bit and i started to think back on it and yeah it was those moments so even with me i i i, I would love to tell this heroic story that's epic and i looked into the sky and i said consig no actually there, there there was a lot of fear in i think every entrepreneur right in the beginning and um it's not in everybody to do it it's every it's in everybody to think it everybody would like to think to be an entrepreneur to do it you got to be a little crazy and dumb i say intelligence might not be the best thing because if you're smart and you think about being an entrepreneur, if you're actually smart, that doesn't make any mathematical sense that you're actually going to be the 10% that makes it in the first year, right? I mean, all the statistics are against you. You're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. And if you actually listen to that, then you definitely should be an entrepreneur. But if you're the person that kind of goes, oh, I'm going to do it anyway. Eh, yeah, it's okay. I'm going to do it. Well, you might have a shot. I love it. Yeah. High risk tolerance has to be greater than IQ <laughs> as intelligence and risk aren't really uh, synonymous. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the second part, the second part of your question about sales, sorry, I didn't get to that. Um, is sales within you? Um, sales can be taught. Sales can be learned. Uh, you can train a salesperson. I spent a large part of my career, probably half of my career, in the position of developing and creating salespeople that weren't salespeople um, or the stereotypical salesperson. In fact, the stereotypical salesperson, more often than not, is the worst salesperson imaginable. You know, if we go down the list of what we assume a salesperson to be A type personality, outgoing, charismatic, suave, um, hardworking, extroverted, extreme. In fact, those, <laughs> a lot of times, a lot of those characteristics do not work for a sell. Introverts are better salespeople because they listen. They sit back and they're having a conversation and analyzing what you're saying. Maybe taking an bit and, and really taking the right notes and getting the right pain points and trying to find a solution. More similar to a doctor than somebody who's just trying to throw products at you. So um, I would say that Sales can definitely be taught. It does not have to be in you, but you would have to want to sell to be an effective salesperson. If you want to sell, you're able to learn. And if you have the right mentors, you have the right guidance, you have the right practices, I don't see a problem at all. That's good. I would totally agree with that too. As someone who's on and off had sales coaches throughout my career, thankfully I feel like I've had a, a good foundation but quickly in interactions with them, you find how sometimes natural tendencies, personality, wanting to, to be the showman versus listen that 70% um, can hurt you in the sales process. And so those folks can help work those maybe natural bad habits out of you to make you a better salesperson, which you needed that coaching and that training to even realize that, hey, maybe personality toned back a little bit actually helps you be more successful and accomplish the goal that you're looking to accomplish in whatever scenario you may be in whatever deal you're going after. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, not a lot of people believe me, um, but I'm an extreme introvert who runs a sales organization globally. <laughs> so if you actually, and when people meet me, they think I'm a big extrovert and all that stuff. And actually, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a B-type personality and I'm actually very introverted. However, 
I've been trained by really amazing global salespeople from, you know, the last 15 to 16 years. And, you know, I've been able to internalize and create my own way of still being able to convey and do business while also still being quite an introvert person, you know, watching movies and kind of recharging at home. Oh, that's good. I think personality can play into um, the area and approach of sales. You could be more talented in versus less as well. I just think of like a transactional sell versus a consultative sell. You know, certain people who are like really fast, really quick, big talkers, big personality could be good at a transact transactional scenario, like a car salesman or you know somebody maybe retail um, who's good with that fast pace. There doesn't need to be a ton of discovery. And it's just like, hey, here you go. Here's the best car for what you're wanting to do today. Move on to the next. Um, so in that case, that type of personality doesn't necessarily need to be completely changed to be successful. But now when you look at consultative, the space you and I play way more heavily in, it does take a slow down, a listen, a real problem solving, a real emotional intelligence capacity that comes over time and over experience to be able to really solve the right problems for those individuals versus just be transactional and whip out whatever the first offer is that one thing they said maybe mirrors and makes sense to then you know, move forward into a sales process with. Absolutely. I mean, one thing I don't say in the movies where they show the type personalities that are doing transactional sales or the people that are doing that is how many people have buyer's remorse after. If you're forcing a sell and you won, yeah, you may have won that day, but did you call that exact person a month later and ask them, how did they feel about it? Because yes, you got the transaction done, but are, were they actually happy, right? Where the consultative sell, I could probably call you a year from now and say, hey, I got another product. And they'd be like, hey, absolutely. You know, so it, it's, it, there, there's a lot of data around types of selling and um, there's pros and cons to both sides, right? Let's say the consultative sell is very boring, less exciting, doesn't stroke much ego, it takes time. Um, maybe someone might be yawning, but at the end of the day, they know what they got, right? Where <laughs> you have the transactional sell who's hoping for the best, that's throwing it at you, getting it, but you know, there's a higher chance that person says, well, what did I buy? What, what was that, you know? So it all has its own kind of uh, ebbs and flows, I guess you could say. Now, William, I have one final question for you. I would love to get your perspective on what is a guiding principle that you have lived by to be successful in business? People, leverage people, understand the world, understand, and this sounds really cliche, but I'll explain kind of what I mean. Leverage diversity, leverage people, leverage the world, know the world, know the world's foods, know the world's media, cinema, music, understand how people operate and also operate with each other people is the only reason why my company can exist and not just people i'm american and i'm probably one of the few americans in the in the whole organization but like the whole point is um understanding the world i've seen the power of using earth to do earth's work and um that has really been a guiding principle for me right? To always look at people, look at the uh, servers and restaurants and look at the sales skills they have and maybe give them a shot or the bartender or uh, the teacher who's teaching third grade, which is the hardest job you could ever have is teaching third grade and say, you know, you have public speaking, you have this, you have that. And um, these kind of people really shaped my guiding principle, my worldview, which is People are actually amazing and diversity is amazing and understanding the complexities of the world might be one of the most powerful tools anybody could use in order to guide themselves through what we're calling business or revenue generation or corporate, you know, um, that by and large, I'll always bet on people. And a lot of times with people too, they're going to tell you things without even really directly telling you if you stop and listen and and be present more than anything and just see how they engage with their social media see how they engage with others what they wear how they 
view themselves, maybe their relationship to themselves. You can gauge a lot too and be able to pivot and react to that and help people based on a lot of things they don't have to actually verbalize. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I learn so much about uh, the human psyche every day. And I know if my team is going to be watching this, they're probably laughing right at this moment. Um, when I say I learn about people every day and I say, wow, okay, the good, bad and the ugly, but also the great and amazing and reliable as well. And that will always guide me the people and where they're from and their perspectives and culture and how it all kind of comes together. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Well, you're amazing, William. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Loved getting to see you and loved your insights. So thank you so much for sharing. Thanks so much for having me and um, hope to see you guys around. Sounds good. We'll do it again sometime. 